Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's Rebecca Levis coming to you from San Diego, and we're going to study Torah together. Before I get started, I want to announce that I'll be doing a Hooked on Hebrew um, class coming up in April. It's going to start April 25th. I'm going to be doing it live in person here in San Diego at North Coast Calvary Chapel. And I'll be sending you out an email shortly after this um, recording, uh, giving you the exact details as soon as registration opens up. So um, if you're following me, uh, pay attention the next few weeks, I'm going to be sending that invitation out and you'll be uh, able to register there. Now it's going to be a six week class. And as I said, it's going to be live, but I'm hoping to film it and those that are out of town can still participate and register and sign up. And then I will um, hopefully be able to film it and then send you the recorded sessions along with any handouts that I give out in class. So that's the information on the class. So let's put on our Hebrew glasses and look at the Bible through Hebrew eyes. And we're in Exodus 35, 1 through 38, 20. And so let's get started and see what this day is all about. So just to review from last week, we talked about Moses giving the two sets of tablets to the Israelites as like a ketubah, a promise from the groom to the bride, Israel. That first set that he brought down was written by the very finger of God and, according to the sages, written on sapphire. And when Moses came down and saw them all dancing around the golden calf, well, that was like she was cheating on him. She was not being um, faithful, the faithful wife. So God's word and promises, the ketubah, was rejected by Israel. The word was literally thrown down and the covenant was broken the covenant to obey and follow which is what they said they would do when they first got to the mountain remember they backed away and god called them up to the mountain after three days but the people were afraid and they moved back and said no moses will go for us and then when moses came down they said oh yeah we'll do everything god said but then when he went back up to get the ten commandments and the tablets, they cheated on them, and they were dancing with another man, so to speak. So this was a broken covenant. So it was like Jesus, Yeshua, when he came the first time, they were unfaithful, and they actually crucified him. Now, the second set of tablets, we're going to call version 2.0. Moses had to take plain old stone and carry it up to the top of the mountain where before God provided. This time it would be Moses having to carry this load. It was almost like he was carrying the spiritual load of the people who were disobedient and who cheated on God. Okay, so it's like the bride cheating on the groom. All right, so this second set came with curses and that is consequences for disobedience. See, he had never intended for her to disobey and to not want to obey. So they didn't come with any kind of consequences. But since he came down and saw that they had taken on some of the behavior of the pagan nations around them, this is when he said, okay, now there's going to be consequences for not following the rules. And that's the curse of the law. So we talked about that last week, and ultimately it'll be the Messiah, Yeshua, who will live that t Torah or law perfectly. And then he became a curse by dying on a cross. And he paid that ransom, which was death for those that disobeyed. So you see, he paid the consequence for all of our sin, the sin of the whole world. And he forgave the bride at his first coming. Remember when he died on the cross, the bride, Israel, is standing in front of him. And he says what to the father? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then he's going to restore that relationship with Israel once again when he comes his second time. And he's going to come in the spirit of Messiah ben David. First time, Messiah ben Joseph. Second time reigning king like David. So this is the picture of the two sets of tablets. So I wanted to make sure I got that in. Otherwise, this isn't going to make sense through the rest of the teaching. 
So Israel's second chance, that's what I call this. So God was going to renew his covenant. He gave her a second chance by giving her the second set of tablets. He offered her his love and forgiveness. Now, God's timing of the two sets of the tablets are significant. That first version, when he went up, was given on Shavuot, the Feast of Shavuot, or Feast of Weeks. Uh, we call it Pentecost, and it was on the 17th day of Tammuz. The second set, I'll call version 2.0, was actually given on the same day as Yom Kippur. It's like God giving the Day of Atonement a second chance to forgive Israel, the wayward bride. So you can see all these um, feasts and dates are so important. Otherwise, you don't make connections to what Jesus came to do and what he said and all of his promises. So he's fulfilling like a faithful group all his promises, even though we are faithless. And I'm speaking corporately, the whole world. Okay, so that's the story of the tablets. It's a spiritual recovery program. I like to call it the 10 step program. So these are the 10 commandments. So for generations, think about this. Israel, this band of slaves that had been in Egypt knew very little personally, if anything, about their spiritual fathers and the promises that God made to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But after the golden calf, God would no longer dwell with them in the camp. This was, this was his original desire, like a groom and a bride would dwell together in the same house. Well, after she cheated on him, then he would no longer be in the midst of the camp with Israel. But now he would put the mishkan or the tent outside Israel's camp. And now they would have to go out to him. And that's like a picture of version 2.0. Now, at this point, it was as if the bride and groom were technically married, however, separated because of her sin. So she had to do some personal inventory and say, okay, do I really want to follow the one who redeemed me from that old life of slavery and oppression and cruelty? Or do I want my own way? Or do I live in fear of what he might ask of me? And that's pretty much what you see today with people that, are like, oh, I don't go to church. I, you know, it's just a bunch of rules and all that. Well, everyone has to come to a point where they have to make a decision. And who am I going to serve? Am I going to serve myself? Or am I going to serve the one who gave me life, gave me every breath and every heartbeat? And that's the question that it comes down to. So this is significant. We're going to be talking a lot about the tabernacle and all the things involved with the tabernacle. As a matter of fact, did you know there's 50 chapters dedicated to the building of the tabernacle? Now, here's a quote from the Humash. The Humash is a commentary on the Torah and the oral law, the Talmud. Here's the quote. Man's faithfulness to provide a dwelling place, the tent, the Mishkan, for God's presence relies on man's faithfulness to build it exactly as God said. This will determine man's relationship with God for all future generations. Think about that. So all this detail that God is pounding into them over and over and over. Here's how it's to look. Here's what's supposed to go on in there. Here's what you can and can't do. Here's who can come in and who can't. <laughs> Excuse me. All of that detail is for a reason because it's foreshadowing will ultimately go on in us as his image bearers and the one who will carry around the actual tabernacle, his presence inside of us. So the primary reason for its existence revolves around man's worthiness to have this tabernacle dwell within their midst. That was God's plan. And ultimately, through the Holy Spirit, he will dwell in our midst. And that will be uh, brought about by the first coming of the Messiah. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He said, if I don't leave you, ascend back to the Father, then I can't send you the Holy Spirit, which is what? The presence of God to dwell in our tabernacle. I call this temple maintenance when I go to the gym because I'm taking care of my temple. 
So that's the purpose of the tabernacle. So Israel was like this motley crew of ex-slaves, fractured, fragmented, and fragile in their faith, and recovering from spiritual adultery now after the golden calf. So I, I like to look at Israel like this little seed who's below, below the ground. You can't really see what she's supposed to be yet, but she's going to turn into the tree of Israel, which ultimately all nations will be grafted into their tree of faith. So this little seed is going to become the tree of Israel. So spiritually, they were like dormant seeds. They had no roots, branches, blossoms, or fruit. However, Adonai had his master plan in place. He knew where he was taking his bride. So their old role had to be erased, okay? What she did in her past. And now there would be new sets of behavior. So that's part of this whole setting up of this dwelling place for God. So in her old form, she was in darkness. Her life was a disaster. She was unified then by hardship and slavery. So this is what kept them bonded is that they were all suffering together. There was no interpersonal bonding with God. It was with one another and it was out of hardship and slavery. But they had become stiff necked towards God. And you can imagine they're saying, well, those that did believe in God, imagine they're in this situation. I mean, probably more than 50 percent or maybe 75 would be saying, well, if, if there's really a God, why is this happening to me? Have you ever been there where you say, well, if, if I'm serving God and, and I, I'm faithful, how come he's not giving me what I desire and, and how come I'm suffering? I know I've been there. So look at what was going on. They were stiff necked. It's the word adoff. Here it is. Adopt means to refuse to bow. That's what it means when I'm stiff-necked. I won't bow to another's authority. And it means to cast aside as well. In other words, they just threw God out. And they said, oh, that's like a genie in a bottle. Didn't work for me. You've heard people say that, right? So God's new role for them in Canaan was to be a transformational role of cooperation and obedience with God, but a cooperation with one another. So it would be them working together in sync with God. And that was supposed to be her new role. And they were to be unified in their hearts and to become a great cloud of witnesses. Remember when Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 10, 1, he says, we, are, we were all under the cloud. And that's the whole point is that we're under the authority of God. And that's the cloud of now witnesses. We're going to get into that word witness in just a minute. So this um, portion today is called Vayachel. And it comes from this word, kahal, kof, he, lamed. It means to gather, assemble, to implement a plan. And as a noun in Greek, it's the word ecclesia or church or congregation. So there's always been the church, right? If people say, oh, the church started in Acts 2. And I say, no, no, the church has always been the church. It's wherever people gather to worship God is ecclesia, church, congregation. Where did they congregate? So God had given Moses the pattern and the plan. That's why it took 50 chapters to drive this home to the Israelites. Now, they were called to be witnesses, the great cloud of witnesses, as we embrace his words. Redemption has already happened. He brought them out of Egypt, but now they were to be bearing witness to the words given to them by God so that they could then impact the surrounding nations. So God would add a new role now for Moses, not just as a redeemer to get them out of Egypt or an intercessor to go up on the mountain and plead with God not to destroy them after the first set was broken. And he was going to judge. Remember, Jethro suggested he get elders to help him judge the people. Well, now he was going to take on the role of a rabbi. He was going to be the one teaching them how to worship, teaching them what should go on within the Mishkan, the tabernacle. So Moses took many roles as he um, 
was like the first redeemer. And you can totally compare this to the New Testament, where Yeshua, M M Mashiach, Moshe, Mashiach, see, M-S, M-S, they share two of the three root letters. All Hebrew words have three root consonants. No vowels, just three consonants. And two is in Moshe's name, and two are in Mashiach. See that? So not just was Moses a redeemer, intercessor, and judge, and rabbi, but also the Mashiach, Jesus, in the New Testament. See, Moses was a foreshadowing of the Messiah. Now let's look further at that word witness. Uh, Exodus 35, 1 begins this parasha. It says, Moses gathered or assembled all the congregation, and that's the word kahal. We just talked about that. So the community is another word, and that's the word eda. Eda means to adorn or decorate, and it also means this, if you take these first two letters, it's the word for to witness. You add your words to adorn a certain event as a witness. So when you come together as a community, you're coming together to make witness that you're a follower of the God of Israel. And now in the New Testament, we come and congregate or go to church to be witnesses and worship the one that we follow. So these words are really beautiful in Hebrew. And look, even the word Adonai, which is Lord, capital L-O-R-D in our Hebrew study Bible, it also has those same two letters. See that? I and Dalit, I and Dalit, I and Dalit. So we're to be one with God, a community of worshipers. And the word Adon, where we get the word Adonai, means to satisfy, sustain, and provide a base. Oh, that's the tabernacle, everybody. Isn't that beautiful? So Adonai is making a base camp basically, right? Hebrews 12, believers were to become his great cloud of witnesses. A community acts as a witness and adorns the worship. See how that's so beautiful? That's why you have to take my hooked on Hebrew class. Okay, God's first priority for his people started with, remember we talked about Shabbat last week, so I'm not going to go into that again. But it was to be for you and I, a time of intimacy and fellowship with God. They were to set aside this time for worship. It was a time of intimacy with God. Then he said, do not kindle a fire in your dwelling, which means don't kindle your fire. Let God kindle the fire of worship. So only God can kindle the fire or to get it started. And that's why it says, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, literally, that's what it that's what it means, is that God initiates. He comes after us and woos us to himself. And then we surrender and he fills us with the Holy Spirit. Just like husband and wife, he woos the woman. He goes after her. She responds and then he fills her with new life and they have children. So this is the pattern, the covenant of man and wife. So our good works can do nothing. Our kindling, trying to do good works to, to please God, that's dead religion. But we can do nothing of eternal value until we have a transformed heart. And that's different from just being religious. So Galatians 2.20 says, and it is no longer I who live, but the life I now live, I live for the one who saved me and filled me with his Holy Spirit. And that's what his name means. Yasha means to save. And that's his name, Yeshua. Kindle our spiritual fire. So I think that is just a beautiful thought. Now they begin to list here all the things that they're to offer for the building of this special tabernacle. So they were to offer all these things to Moses and the building of the tabernacle. Look at the word for offering. Offer is the Hebrew verb karav. And here it is, kofresh vet. And it's where we get the word korban. Korban is an offering. It means to come close, 
So karav means to come close. So that's why we brought an offering, because when we bring the offering, we come close to God. See how beautiful that is? So a terumah offering had a greater money value and was the most costly. And it means something that you lift up that cost you the most. And it was the most valuable type of offering. And teruma comes from the word room, meaning to lift up high. And it also is the word, interestingly enough, for a bull. Because in that culture, the bulls were the most expensive. The bull was the progenitor. They created more cattle, more, more cows. So the bull was like the highest and the most expensive. So that's where you get this teruma offering. Now, here's what they were to offer. <clears throat> Linens, precious, precious stones, acacia wood, gold and silver, copper, spices, olive oil, incense, purple yarn, red yarn, ram skin, and goat's hair. Everything that had value to them was to be given with a willing heart as an offering. From self-adornment, all these things they used on themselves, right? Gold earrings and perfumes and garments. Now God is saying, all those things that you once valued, would you now offer them to me with a willing heart? Are you going to do it grudgingly? Does God have to pry your fingers loose in order to give generously? So this is true worship. Those who love to come near with a pure heart and serve God freely. That's not dead religion. That is a bride who wants to be with her groom. And that's called born again, true, authentic Christians. Not those that just go to church and call themselves Christians and then go off and live a different lifestyle where they're not kind, they're not loving, they're not patient, they're not uh, filled with God's spirit. They're not... Um, all the things that, that you hoped a Christian would be, that that person is, is lost in their dead religion. And uh, that's something I came out of uh, 50 years ago. And um, I attempt to walk out my life now uh, filled by the Spirit and led by the Spirit. Do I do it perfectly? No. I fall every day. I still have my old nature as long as I'm in this tent, <laughs> right? But but my spirit is stronger than my flesh. And whenever I'm tempted to do something, I have to stop and just say, oh, Lord, Lord, help me to do what's right. Help me to do what pleases you instead of what pleases man. And to the best of our ability as Christians, that's how we're to live. And that's how Paul exhorted um, people to live in the New Testament. So Moses called for this offering from willing hearts. And what's interesting, in chapter 35, I counted the times I saw willing, and it was three times in this chapter. Or to say it another way, you have to have a generous spirit. Do you know people like that? Somebody who's always just, no matter how you treat them, they're kind. No matter what you say, they're gracious with their words or how they respond. Or, you know, they don't have to be the center of attention all the time. <laughs> that wouldn't be me. Um, but let's look closer, those with a willing heart. The word willing is this word, nadav. Nadav means to associate freely with something and to volunteer yourself. And I love that word. If you look at each of these in their ancient symbols, the noon is a, a seed or a sperm, and it's found in the word ben for sun. This is an N in English. So this is the N, meaning a seed or a sperm. And then the D is a dalit. It means door or an entryway. And then this letter, bet or vet, it's the same letter, means a house or a kingdom. So it's like when we're willing, we, we are like children of God that come to the doorway of his church and want to worship in his house, the one we serve. And that is coming willingly with a pure heart. I love these words, don't you? Put that in the back of your Bible. Now, instructed Bezalel, we talked about him last week in Oh Aholiab. Um, 
Bezalel was given special wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And I said he was the son of Uri, light, or is light. And so he had special revelation. And that's what revelation is, is to bring light. Matter of fact, the word for morning, boker, when the sun comes up, means to search out or to seek. And it means to search out in the darkness. And that's what morning is. So anyway, he was from the tribe of Judah, same as the Messiah. So he was going to be the one to design this and actually put it together as a master designer. And to me, that also foreshadows what the Messiah would do in the New Testament and in the future kingdom where God will design his house and who will come in and what will go on there. And um, he will invite those into his tabernacle or tent. Now, God lists the furnishings of the Mishkan and the garments of the Kohen that will serve him in the holy place and the holy of holies. So the people had to travel. Now, remember, God kept moving them from place to place. So far, they're still at the mountain, but he's going to be moving them. Remember, they wandered 40 years. So they're going to have to take this tabernacle, put it up, take it down, put it up, take it down, everywhere they go. So it had to be them taking God's presence with in the form of this tent all through their wandering. And really, it's I look at this as, a, as my life, your life as Christians, and we're like, oh my gosh, we take his presence with us everywhere we go. And I remember that when I walk in the gym, when I go to the supermarket, when I go into church, wherever I go, I'm like, Lord, I'm taking you with me. Show me what to do. Show me what to say. Tell me who might need a, a word of encouragement or truth today. And uh, this is how we're to live our lives. So this is what it means to bear witness in our worship is that we are to bring the glory and the honor to Jesus. And that is the goal of all worship. And all of our lifestyle is not to lift ourselves up, but to serve him and be good representatives or witnesses to what he is and who he is. So we give away what's most valuable in exchange for what God values. So money, time, right? Um, dedicate our families, um, dedicate our homes. Uh, we give to others what God values, and that is ourselves. So building a place for him to dwell in the midst of us, we first have to invite him in. And that's what salvation is all about. He doesn't come crashing in and break the door down like a SWAT team. He knocks on the door and waits for us to open it. And then he says, I'll come in and we'll have fellowship. We'll be family. And so this is God's camp right here. And he knocks and he says, I, I stand here and I I'm calling you. Have you ever looked back on your life and think, oh, who was it who prayed for me when I was lost? <laughs> A lot of people praying for me. Um, but there's always somebody, usually somebody says, oh, it was my grandmother or something like that. Or a mother who was faithful to pray. And that's what I tell my sons. I said, boy, your mom has prayed you through every stage of your life, your mom and dad. And uh, this is part of our role because uh, we go to the father who knows our kids even better than we do. So um, people gave out of gratitude. Um, I see I have an error here, P-O-P-L-E. Okay, they gave out of gratitude, right? There was no manipulation or threats or guilt trips, no big fundraising campaigns. Their hearts were fully committed. They repented after the golden calf. And now this is what we see, all this generosity coming. Now, this reminds me of member 9-11, how the country was so divided and blah, blah, blah. And then when there was an attack on the whole nation, suddenly everybody came together, fully committed as one. We saw flags flying from every car, every house. You know, everybody was helping their neighbor. Everybody was giving. Well, this is what we're seeing here in this story. The hearts were fully committed now, giving willingly, cheerfully, lavishly, and consistently. And that's a good lesson for us in our walk today, isn't it? So there would be no just lip service. You know, you say one thing and do another. They had to do it in order to prove that they actually 
had a change of heart because of this golden calf experience. Well, that's what repentance is. We look back and regret and we repent. And we say, God, you know, I, I, I offended you and violated your standards. And I know that. And I repent of that. I ask you to forgive me and fill me with your Holy Spirit that I can walk after and follow your son, Jesus. And that's the transformed born again experience. James 2, 24 says a man is proved righteous by his actions, not by faith alone, saying one thing and then doing another. They have to come together. Your faith and your words have to match. And Psalm 110.3 says, all will be willing in that day, what day? When the Messiah comes to set up his kingdom. So he set up his kingdom in his first coming as Yosef, uh, Messiah ben Yosef. He set it up as his kingdom. Then he went back to be with the Father and sent us the Holy Spirit. Now that's available to everyone, every nation. And if you receive that redemption through the blood of the Messiah and by faith, then he fills us with his Holy Spirit. And now that presence dwells in us. So this Mishkan and this tabernacle is really the key to everything. So what was their sign of unity? Well, they had to have a we mentality, not just me. So before it was all about themselves. But now they've had this incident with the golden calf. They've repented. And now they're coming together, unified, working continuously, consistent behavior towards each other, not fighting, slandering, murmuring. But unfortunately, people can continue to repeat the same cycles. So then I'm like, oh, boy, it's going to take another crisis to get our nation back to functioning again as one and united. And I just hope it's not... Uh, not something so tragic like nuclear war, something like that. Um, but Jesus did warn that there will be troubling times coming in the last days. And I think we are in the birth pangs of that right now. So they had finally changed the attitude and developed a sense of family. Okay. Their transformation had begun at Mount Sinai and didn't God say to Moses, I'm going to send you down there. You're going to pull them out and worship me on this mountain. That's what he said in the burning bush. So now here they are. They're setting up a place to worship. So God was faithful to do what he said. They were giving all that they had with a whole heart, personally and passionately. I say it's like checking Israel's vital signs. I'm a nurse, so I'm like, oh, take, take Israel's pulse. And we used to say there's, there's two kinds of pulses, you know, weak and thready or bounding and pounding. And that is where they are right now. So the bride of Israel was beginning to develop, and I put love in here, a heart of passion for Adonai, their groom. And so this is what we want. We want to do, give willingly, like husband and wife, give willingly to one another in order to be a we mentality, not a me mentality. Boy, it takes a while to learn that, doesn't it? I'm on 47 years this summer, and <laughs> we're still saying, wait, we're a team. It's not, it's not who's right or who gets their way. So this was Israel's, I like to say, extreme bridal passion of extravagant giving from their hearts. They were spiritually on fire. Honeymoon phase, right? Remember, those people had been slaves. Nothing of value had ever been theirs. But when they went out, they were given stuff by the Egyptians. And what were they willing to do then? Give it right back to God. So I say to yourself and to me, what are you willing to give to God? Your money, your time, your children and their future, your marriage, your job. What is it that you most value that you have to just hold out and say, Lord, it's all yours. Do with it what you want. And I'll try to be a good steward of what you give me. That's the Christian walk. So they made the bronze labor for cleansing. We went over that last week, and I'm not going to go over it again. But just to show you this word for mirror, they were uh, the women gave their bronze mirrors. Okay. They put those in to, to make this bronze labor for cleansing by the priests. But what I love about the word mirror is the word mara. 
Mara came from these wealthy women and it comes from the word to see. That's where they get the word mirror. So you see the things that they use to look at themselves in and admire themselves. Oh, don't I look good today? They said, oh, I'm going to get rid of self and I'm going to give that to the priesthood. And now it's going to be used as a thing of cleansing. Wow. That's like getting rid of ego and pride, isn't it? So what had been used to view self became a container to cleanse, right? So once our eyes are off ourselves, we can focus then on the needs of others. I see another little typo there. So these were the mirrors that the women looked in. I saw one of these from Egyptology uh, website where they showed these bronze mirrors. And it reminded me of the New Testament where it says we see in a mirror dimly. We just see an, an image, but it's not the image, which is Jesus. So, but then we'll see him face to face. So when they looked in this bronze um, basin with the water, it, they could see their own reflection and it would remind them that they needed cleansing. Just like when women look in a mirror and they're admiring their hair or their makeup or don't I look good? And then you go, wait, what I really want to admire when I look in the mirror is the fact that I'm here and I'm serving God so that I can be a reflection of him, not just me. I wrote a poem once that started, um, let's see. Uh, what do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you know why you're living? Do you know why you're here? And uh, it goes on. But it's next time you look in the mirror, thank God for who you are, just the way you are. And thank him for all that he's given you and the ability to serve him and honor him as you walk in this world. So, Itamar was the man. He was the son of Aaron. He was in charge of chronicling all that was given. And here's all the different measurements of what was given. And he was like an historian as well as a chronicle of who gave what. And some people say that he actually may have assisted Moses in writing, because he was the writer, the scribe, um, of writing the Torah. But look at all these measurements, 2,000 pounds of gold. 7,000, that's over three times the amount of silver. I think that's interesting. Three times 7,000 silver is the, the symbol of redemption. So, uh, and then bronze would be half of that, almost half. Um, but these are the things that would be in the temple. And a talent would be a kikar. And it's through 3,600 shekels. And originally, a talent was a measurement because everything was measured. They didn't have coins. They would just measure grain against a certain gold. And then that would be how many shekels it would be. Shekel means to weigh. So later in Jesus' time, a shekel being weighed would actually turn into a shekel coin. So that's what we see in the New Testament. So there's pictures of how to build it, and I'm not going to go into it in great length here, um, but just to show you that they talked about these planks and how many there were to be and how there were to be sockets that they sat in. And here, here they are. These sockets were made of silver, and then these planks were covered with gold. And what's interesting is these planks, here they are, individual planks with the curtains draped here, and these are the silver hooks that, that, that hooked these, um, these uh, linen to the planks covered with gold. Here's the silver top and they were put in a silver um, like base here. But there was one that went right through the middle from the front of the tabernacle all the way to the back from the first to the last plank. And it was covered with gold and it was different than all the other planks. And it went right through the middle from beginning to end. And I'm like, that was the ultimate stabilizer. And this plank that, that was the middle of the five was the one that held it all together. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like the Messiah. He would come and fill us with the Holy Spirit in us. And that would be our stabilizer. And it's worth its weight in gold. Gosh, there's so much, so much symbolism in this tabernacle. We're going to get into it more 
uh, in the book of Leviticus also. So I'm going to save that for later. But I just wanted you to see that. So did you know that they started assembling the Mishkan on the first of Nisan? That is the month of redemption. Remember, they came out of Egypt in um, the month of Nisan, or they celebrate the Passover in Nisan. And it was the first of Nisan that they began assembling the tabernacle. So he gives great detail. Well, sometimes it, it's so astonishing and somewhat exhausting <laughs> reading all this detail. But you know why? Because the exactness of the structure is foundational for the whole structure to stand as one. So nothing could be misshaped or broken or twisted or not in the right angle. Everything depended on each one being perfect in order for it to stand withstand weather and I'm like oh my gosh this is like us in the New Testament all of us are being made stable through the Holy Spirit so that we as a body of Messiah the church can function as a community of believers and that's the title of this parasha Vayecha, and they gathered so we're going to stand as one and be strong because we have the stabilizer from beginning to the end of our walk. And it will not collapse as long as we stand shoulder to shoulder, like those pillars. And you can see all these words of Yeshua in the New Testament and Rabbi Shaul, Paul, when they make these things, like we serve him shoulder to shoulder, or we, this is, this is picturing the manifestation of the tabernacle. Where God dwelt with man. So um, yeah, there's lots to cover and we'll be doing more of that. So it was a unique placement and function within the family of God. And that's what each of us are. So God is the master builder of the house and designed each part personally and perfectly. That's you and me. There's no problem with our identity, people. God created each human being for specific design Purpose, plan, function, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Your identity was not a mistake. Let me just say that. So this foreshadows the Messiah coming and being the one ultimately who stabilizes the whole world. Okay. Jesus said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom, the tabernacle the ultimate tabernacle in heaven. So you see, Jesus is saying words that ping pong back and forth, having to do with the setting up of his presence. And this is where it is. He starts with the altar and the Holy of Holies. That's our heart. And this dwelling place is called a mishkan. I already mentioned that. But it comes from the word shakan, meaning to dwell with. So this whole picture that spent 50 chapters was a picture of you and I. And we get the word Shakinah, or we say in English, we put an emphasis on a different uh, uh, syllable. We say Shekinah, but in Hebrew, it's Shakinah on the end syllable. But that's the same word for his glory. That's where he's going to dwell. So that is spiritual intimacy, where we have vision and revelation and spiritual growth within us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Praise God. So look at what Jeremiah the prophet said would happen in the Messianic age where the Messiah would come and begin to set up his tabernacle during the Messianic age. This was began in his first coming. All nations are gathered to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant, which dwelt in that very inner Holy of Holies, will not even be missed. So what? It's going to be missing. But they said, you're not going to miss it. Why? Because it shall be in those days when you are multiplied and increased in the land where God wants to take us, they will no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And it will not even come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it, nor will it be made ever again. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Oh my gosh. So where the Ark of the Covenant dwells, is going to be where his throne dwells ultimately. 
And that's the throne of our heart. And ultimately, of course, manifested in the spiritual realm, which is the throne of God. So for the name of the Lord uh, will be in Jerusalem, and that will be his throne. It says, nor will they walk anymore in what? Stubbornness of heart. So that is what we look forward to as believers, right? Let's end with Revelation 20, 11. It says, and I saw a great white, what? Throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, you and I, stand before God, and the books were opened. What books? The Bible says we're all keeping books of everything we've ever thought, done, or said, as recorded in the books, plural. I have a record book. You have a record book. And it says, and one day we're all going to stand before this throne and the books will be opened. And another book was opened, which is called the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books, according to their what? Deeds, what they were doing. Now, remember, you're not going to do good deeds until it comes from a good mind and a good heart. And that's what the Holy Spirit gives us. So that's where it begins, the building of our tabernacle. When we repent, when we ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit, and then we give our lives to him as an offering. And we say, Lord, here am I. Send me. I'll go. I'm willing to give up everything for you. I did that July 11th, 1973, and I've never looked back. So I think that's a fine place to stop sharing. I pray that you know him personally, like the Israelites came to know him personally, and give your life as a living sacrifice to him. You'll never regret it. You'll never be the same. And in the end, when they open your book, it'll be empty. All they'll see are white pages. Though your sins were as scarlet, they will be white as snow. So Shabbat Shalom. I pray that you'll share this with friends and I'll see you next week on Sparky's Torah Time. Bye-bye.